Okay, so this is Chris Paul, CEO of Hercules Silver. They they don't want to hear me talk about Sunshine Mining and some bad mining company from the '90s that was, you know, mining silver in Idaho. They want to speak to you. You know, they want to hear from you. So, Chris, um, let's get started. Uh, first, you know, I know most of the people that are on this follow the company and they know the story to some extent. So I don't want to go super high level, but I do want to, you to explain how this company went from being focused on silver to now finding a copper porphyry or what you interpret to be a copper porphyry. Like how did this process get to where you're at today? Yeah, no, for sure. Well, in a nutshell, you've had, you know, 20 years of, of historical exploration here from the 60s through to the 80s. You know, you had 308 holes drilled. There was even back in the 1800s, there was actually a lot of silver mining out here. Um, what's really remarkable is that none of those 308 holes ever drilled deep enough, um, obviously, to, to find this copper porphyry, which was which was feeding it. So, we didn't know, you know, when we bought this thing in 2021, obviously, you know, we had no idea that there was any copper potential at that time. So, you know, they were focused on, you know, call it the resource area, which is kind of like the Hercules at it in the frog pond. And, you know, very sort of, you know, geared towards putting together a, a relatively small resource which they could put into production so they were doing like feasibility studies you know small scale feasibility studies um in kind of the late 70s when silver price was was ripping up to like 50 bucks um you know silver price of course crashes you know the the, the story with the hunt brothers there tried to corner the market crashed it and, you know, that was kind of the beginning of the end uh, for, for all that, you know, for their dreams of, of starting a silver mine there. Um, you know, silver price pretty well, you know, stayed in the dumps for about 20 years, uh, you know, fell by the wayside. It was, it was basically held in an estate for almost 40 years. But um, anyways, when, when they were doing all this exploration, they weren't looking at the big picture, right? They were, they were really just geared towards building that resource, you know, short vertical holes. They wanted, you know, a shallow sort of open pit thing. So, you know, we looked at that and obviously that was the main reason for picking it up. Um, and, and that resource area was left open for expansion. You know, they were getting good continuity. We thought for sure, you know, there's really, really good potential to grow this to a much larger resource. But, um, you know, this is obviously this is 2021 and, and, and we're going to take much more of a sort of modern systematic approach to the exploration. So, you know, we start off by, you know, like there was four, three or four companies also in here back then. So it was kind of fragmented. Now we bought the core land position. Uh, we were able to expand that by staking. So we, we staked up to like 10,000 plus acres now. So for the first time, we've now kind of consolidated the, the, the whole system. We've consolidated the bigger picture. And so we set out and we did, you know, soil sampling, uh, rock sampling, you know, terra spec, mapping, geophysics, you name it. And, uh, you know, it, it was when we got the results of the soils back, uh, the first round of soils, because, you know, the historical guys were just focused on that Hercules rally to the west. Uh, you know, we're, we're dealing with kind of rolling grasslands. You don't have a lot of oak crop exposure here. Um, and, and it was really the soils that we blanketed off to the east. You know, they lit up with all this copper gold molybdenum. And so that was interesting. So we went back. We did another round of soil sampling to kind of infill that, get really good definition on it. And, you know, by then we had about 3,000 soil samples covering, you know, the greater area. And it was pretty obvious what was going on at that point, because you've got this big sort of two kilometer diameter copper gold molybdenum monopoly and all around this beautiful zone, silver lead zinc, you know, hay. You know, textbook sort of, you know, district scale or, or, or you know, regional scale metal zonation patterns, which you always see around porphyries. So now we're looking at this going, okay, so these guys were focused on this one little resource area at Hercat and Frog Pond. 
but that's like 2% of, you know, what we're sort of zooming back now and seeing as the bigger picture. So, uh, you know, anyways, you know, that's all good and that's all fun. And, you know, we ended off, this is 2022, by the way, we're doing all this sort of Greenfields work. And, you know, we sort of ended off the Greenfields work last year with this IP survey. And, you know, initially we kind of wanted to cover the entire property, but we were having uh, some sort of budget issues because the cattle, you know, there was, there's, there's a, a grazing lease out there and the cattle are tripping up the IP lines. Am I back? Chris, Am I back? Am I back? You're Am back, back, man. <laughs> you're oh, back. Man. <laughs> I go, I go through this What's thing. going on? Is it the Wi-Fi or, or is it your phone signal? I'm on LTE now. So I, I've dropped off the Wi-Fi and I'm back on LTE. I mean, I, I finished this huge rant, looked down at my phone. <laughs> and i'm like okay great so how, how that's much, funny how, how much did i get in before you were I... talking about the cows and grazing oh god and then uh... way back there. <laughs> okay okay so so look uh I'm, I'm gonna start to speed it up a bit here i'm on the lte now so hopefully it doesn't drop again uh i'm just gonna keep an eye on on uh on the on the screen and uh, yeah, hope for the best. So, okay. So we're, we're, we're talking about the IP. So, so we end up, you know, just basically covering, uh, the Western part of the property. So, so we really just survey, uh, you know, the Rhyolite, the Rhyolite hosted silver and, and the survey was really just designed to get, you know, high resolution data in the near surface, sort of the upper, you know, zero to sort of 300, 250 meters. And, uh, so anyways, the, the, the funny thing is, is we get the results back and, you know, there's almost no chargeability response uh, in the resource area, um, any, any of the other targets we've got. And so, you know, it turns out that the silver mineralization, which is hosted in a mineral called tetrahedrite, tetrahedrite is, I guess, is just not responsive to chargeability. So, you know, we were kind of, you know, obviously bummed about that, but, you know, down at the lower limit of the survey, you know, we've, we've got this huge 1.8 kilometer long, you know, ginormous chargeability anomaly that's showing up at sort of the lower depth limit of the survey. So, you know, cautiously optimistic about this thing because we don't really have an explanation for it. If, if, the, if the silver mineralization, you know, where we know is, is really strong is not lighting up. Um, it doesn't really make sense that that's all going to be silver mineralization, but it doesn't really make sense that it's going to be copper either because, you know, our, our nearest copper uh, on surface is like, you know, a, a kilometer to the east, right? We've got this big zone system that the copper porphyry is to the east, the silver lead zinc is a halo all around it. So obviously cautiously optimistic about this thing, but, um, you know, we go into this drill season. You know, we, 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 we start off in, uh, in the resource area. So we start in the frog pond, you know, ground conditions are challenging, you know, give the drillers a few sort of easy holes to get warmed up, figure out what bits and muds and everything to use. And, you know, then it comes time to, you know, we, we, we want to test this chargeability. We got to know what the heck this thing is before we go spending a whole bunch of money drilling, you know, silver. We, we want to know if this is important or not, but we also, we don't want to just drill a deep hole, you know, and, and have it be a duster. So, you know, we get a little kind of cute with it. Uh, you know, we find an area where we can sort of step out on the silver mineralization, uh, you know, have a high probability of successfully getting some silver, uh, and then we can keep it going. And if it's nothing, it's nothing. Uh, but we, you know, at least that hole's not a duster. So, you know, of course, that was hole five. And of course, you know, we did get, you know, I think 70 or so meters of, of, of nice silver mineralization uh, where we would expect it in the frog pond. Uh, and then you hit, you know, what's typically was always the shutdown rock. So, so the, the historical guys would, would hit that andesite unit underneath it and shut down. So we kept it going. We get down to uh, basically the top of this chargeability anomaly and right at the, you know, right where the chargeability starts we hit this major fault zone and, you know, the world changes. So, you know, we go from, you know, the Jurassic, uh, you know, rhyolites and, and andesites for chose the silver and we break through into, you know, what, what is the Triassic, you know, we call it the seven devils group. 
And just immediately, right off the bat, we are in absolutely intense porphyry style alteration, uh, uh, veining, you know, mineralization. Um, so just, you know, never in my wildest dreams did I think that, you know, this, this huge copper target off to the east, uh, you know, 1.3 kilometers away, I think, to the nearest copper showing would actually extend you know, dipped shallow underneath all that silver mineralization and, uh, and continue. And so now basically, you know, what that told us was, yeah, that copper anomaly that we're seeing to the east, that's just the eastern limit of the system, right? Think of it as like, you know, I, I simplify, say the upper plate is, is the rhyolite silver. That was thrust, that was basically faulted. And, and so, you know, when this porphyry system formed, you know, off in the Pacific Ocean, you know, that would have been sort of lateral to it. It would have been, you know, maybe a couple kilometers off to the west. When this thing was all pushed up onto the continent in, in sort of the mid-Jurassic, you know, that silver that was off to the side basically got thrust vaulted and it was pushed up and over the majority of the porphyry copper system. So all that copper we're seeing to the east, this is just the eastern limit of the system. That's all that's showing us. And, you know, we've got a ton uh, of, of the system that's, that's, you know, basically extending under that rhyolite. And so, you know, for your first, you know, blind hole testing this chargeability anomaly that, that you weren't even that, you know, uh, tremendously optimistic about, I mean, it's just a, obviously a complete game changer for the property. Um, and, 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 you know, there's all kinds of signs from the copper on surface, uh, the chargeability, the scale of the silver system, that there is a massive porphyry copper system down there that's that's feeding all that silver. So, yeah, just just completely changed the world. That's good. That that's a good and and the most overused term in, in junior mining, game changer. But I think in this context, it is actually quite apt. So, just looking through the news that you've put out in 2023, you really kind of like put like little breadcrumbs in each piece of news. You sort of put the clues there for investors to, to read and follow along and, you know, as best you could. And on September 8th, you basically said, Hey, we drilled this hole, uh, 2305 and we tested this chargeability, uh, you know, anomaly at depth and we intercepted porphyry copper alteration and mineralization and assays are pending and then you followed up and said there's four holes that have now been drilled across 1200 meters of this anomaly all of which have hit the good stuff um looking at the section map that you published on october 10th for this 2305 hole it looks like there's a zone of enrichment um there in the quartz porphyry area uh or in in, in one, I guess, in this, this layer, the sweet spot layer. Um, so you, I guess when you were looking at the core of 2305, you knew we, we really got something here. I mean, it, it was kind of, it just, uh, you know, hits you in the face, right? Yeah. Uh, as you guys like to say in the podcast world, lots to unpack there. Uh <laughs> <laughs> I'm just That's look, I'm just glad we're still connected, first of all. Um, okay, great. Yeah, no, <laughs> you know, you sort of talked at, at the beginning about, you know, breadcrumbs and stuff like this. And, uh, you know, it, it's a shitty market out there. And we see a lot of companies, you know, trying their best to, to put out visuals and, and get the market excited on visuals and, uh, you know, sort of overhype, but I don't know. I just, I don't like that approach. You know, it, 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 it usually doesn't end well. So, you know, we're basically trying to under promise and, and over deliver right at the end of the day. And I think that's just kind of a strategy that's been working for us. Um, but yeah, I mean, to talk about what we saw in five, look, you know, we, we broke through that fault zone. There was a, uh, I think 30 meters or so below it that we're, I mean, we're, we're still trying to figure this out. So if, if, you know, this ends up, I'm probably going to have to come back on this in a few months with a different interpretation, but you know, it kind of looks like what's happening is that upper 30 meters has been leached out because if you look at the core photos that we published, there's, you know, 
right below that red conglomerate unit, which is all faulted and sheared up, there's just a ton of this hematite, this earthy hematite. Hematite is iron oxide. So here's the theory. This porphyry copper system formed off in the Pacific Ocean in the early Jurassic. Right after it formed or, or, or shortly after it formed, it looks like something brought this thing to surface. The red conglomerate, conglomerates are erosional surfaces. So what's basically happening is you're eroding down into the top of the porphyry copper system. And you see this in South America, right? This is very typical. And, you know, the upper 30 meters or so get, gets oxidized out. And, and evidence we're seeing for that is you get, you know, in these porphyry coppers, you get these A veins, these B veins, and the B veins will have, you know, chalcopyrite or bornite center lines going through them. And we see that. But instead of the chalcopyrite and boronite, it's, it's all gone to iron oxide. And that's telling us that, that this, this thing was, in fact, at surface. And that upper 30 meters was leached out. And what's happened is, is that copper, we think, was basically remobilized by, you know, weathering and reprecipitated as a super gene enrichment blanket just below that. Now, what is it doing you know, 200 meters below surface. Well, when it was all, as I kind of mentioned, when everything was kind of pushed up onto the continent in mid Jurassic, the silver mineralization gets thrust and pushed up over it. So you've kind of preserved this sort of interesting, you know, sort of very rare, perfect storm of events uh, that's preserved this, this super gene enrichment blanket, which you typically only see in like South America. I mean, this is very, very rare. This is one of the most sort of interesting things that we've got going for us um, because you just don't see this sort of stuff commonly in, in the Northern U S and safe jurisdictions, you know, where you want to see it right in Canada and the U S. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very rare uh, exception that we've got to see the super gene enrichment blanket. Now we knew for sure, you know, you saw that stuff. It was just no doubt about, it. I mean, it was just loaded with copper, but you know, below that, it's, you know, we, we were excited, you know, you see boronite, you see all these high grade copper minerals. And then below that, it transitions into, you know, way more dominantly pyrite. So, you know, we're seeing, you know, in, corp in, in copper porphyry exploration, you're always looking at, you know, what's the ratio of how much calcopyrite do you have to pyrite? Because as you get kind of closer to the high grade core, you know, you, you're not going to see any pyrite. It's all going to be calcopyrite. So that's what you're always looking for. You're trying to vector towards that. And so, you know, below the enrichment zone, it's dominantly pyrite with just a little bit of chalcopyrite. And the alteration is sericite. So they, that's basically telling us, okay, cool. Uh, you know, blind hole. We've obviously found a pop porphyry copper system. It's obviously big. Uh, everything is telling us that we're on the margins of the system. We're nowhere near the high grade core. Um, so, you know, I'll be honest with you. We had four of us in the core shack, right? We all sort of took bets on what the grade was going to be. And we thought, you know, 0 0.2, uh, you know, all the way up to 0 0.3 copper. Um, so anyways, you know, of course we start doing these big 200, 500 meter step outs and the assay results come back. Uh, meanwhile, from the lab, and you know, I should I should mention right, like that hole ended. We hit a post mineral dike, you know, a couple meters of a post mineral dike. We've seen the same dike now in three, four other holes. You know, that thing's about two, three meters wide. So had the drillers not got stuck, you know, that that hole would have kept going. It would have been right back into the the same grade we were in before it. But you know, we thought, you know what, forget it, right? We're we're, we're probably on the margins, and it's okay. Well. Let's start looking for the high grade core. What, you know, shocked us was when the assay report came back. And I think, you know, I'm always scared to open assay results because I'm used to disappointment, right? You know, that's kind of usually how it goes. But I, I think the first 40 or 50 rows uh, of, of this assay sheet was all over limit copper and just absolutely stunned us. Uh, you know, what, what that, you know, hole ran top to bottom, even below the enrichment zone, right? It was still grading a steady half a percent copper in that phyllic stuff, in that marginal alteration that's full of pyrite. So what that's telling us is we've got, 
it's it, it it's a very high you know without getting too technical we've got a lot of sulfur in the system and these are good systems that's that's what you want to see i mean these are like fertility indicators in porphyry coppers we've got two things that are telling us this is a very fertile system we got specularite specular hematite so so we know we had a very high amount of oxygen you want oxygen that's very good and we had a very high amount of sulfur. You want sulfur. Sulfur is good because sulfur is one of your ingredients in forming copper sulfide mineralization. So the more sulfur you've got, the more mineralization you can precipitate. So that's what we know now. Um, obviously, you know, as mentioned, the goal is to, you know, we want to find higher grades. You know, obviously these grades were spectacular, but the signs are telling us there's better. I don't, I don't think the first blind hole we drilled, you know, we, we didn't set up on a trench and, and, and pick a, an area we knew we'd get high grade. This was a shot in the dark. And I, I think, I don't think we just randomly tapped into the best part of this thing. I think there's a lot better to come in the future here. Yeah. Uh, there's a, yeah. So there's a lot, you just said a lot. Um, some of which I understood quite well, some of which was a little over my head, but what really stands out to me is that this was completely blind and the old timers were just focused on the silver near surface, the stuff that was easy to get to. And nobody was able to put the pieces of the puzzle together the way that your team has done in the last you know year and a half and obviously the the chargeability you know the the ip survey that you did helped a lot um and i know you're doing a 3d you know ip right now over the entire property that's i guess not done yet um what can you tell us you know I guess about what you've learned in the last couple of months and what can you tell us about the holes that are still pending? I mean, you spelled it out that you had drilled four deep holes as of September 8th. How many have you drilled now or is it still four and you've just been waiting for the assays to come back on the other three? Yeah. So, so after hole five, uh, we drilled six and seven off the same pad, uh, which were both silver holes. Um, what I did is on the last news release, just to make things very clear, I'm trying to now separate, uh, you know, a news release about the silver from a news release about the copper. The last news release was about the copper. So I only showed on that plant map, I only showed the holes that we drilled in, you know, the deep ones into the copper porphyry target. So there's, uh, there's seven more, I believe, that, that have been completed. They're all shown in blue on that plan map. Uh, and then there's a green one, uh, which is hole 26, which is currently ongoing. That's being drilled to the west. Um, that's going to be another deep one. And I think that makes basically eight more holes um, into this porphyry copper system. So you know, it, it, it's a game of guess and test. That's where we're at right now. Um, we have very little information to work off of at this stage, right? Because um, as I mentioned earlier, that 2022 IP survey was designed to see, you know, we, we basically, you know, it depends how closely you space your little electrodes. So if you have little, you know, closely spaced electrodes, which we did have, you know, a little 40 meter spacing, that's going to get you very high resolution in the near surface. And, and that's basically all we have from the 2022 survey. It was high resolution in the near surface, and there's something big below it. So, you know, you got a little bit of chargeability data down there to work with, but we've drilled, um, you know, you can see on that plan map, we put the dips on there. So anyone that can do trade can kind of figure it out, right? Like there's some deep ones that have gone into this thing. Um, and this, you know, they've gone way below, you know, the chargeability data that we have. So, you know, that kind of spurred us to say, look, we need, you know, this is, this is a blind target. We cannot see the rocks. So now we've launched this big, huge, huge, huge undertaking, 
um, which is a four kilometer, I think it's roughly four kilometer by four kilometer um, IP survey. You know, we've gone all the way to the eastern limit of the copper geochem on surface. Um, you know, as I think I mentioned in the news release that we are seeing vectors um, in the holes that we've drilled that are suggesting, you know, to the west, you know, maybe may our potassic core. I think that was two news releases back. You know, I kind of drew some very rough, you know, concepts on what's going on. So, you know, here's what's going to happen. Basically, you know, it's, it's this 26 is ongoing now. Uh, you know, it's going to take a couple more weeks, two, two, three more weeks to complete, I would imagine, because we're going deep. Uh, that's going to bring us into early November. And, you know, we could drill year round, but, you know, why it's going to be more expensive and we need to take a pause. Uh, you know, we've seen good stuff. We've seen bad stuff. You know, we're, we've got a, pr we've got a pretty good idea. Of, of which way this thing's trending. We haven't talked about that yet in the public, but we're going to wait and, and we're going to get these assays back from the lab. And that's going to give us a tremendous amount of information. We've got other stuff, you know, technical stuff going on, Terra spec. Um, so, you know, we're going to put together a 3D geological model on this thing over the winter. We're going to get, you know, this, this IP survey has been going for three weeks. It's probably got another three weeks to go. I mean, it's probably going to cost us like half a million bucks. I mean, this is a big, big survey, but we've increased the node spacing. So now we're going to be looking down like 800 meters plus on this thing. So it's going to be, you know, other people have suggested, you know, you know, fly an airborne or do this and that. No, we know the IP works, right? Don't reinvent the wheel here. It's going to be expensive, but go with the lowest risk option. We know the IP is working. So we're going to get that data back sometime over the winter. Um, and so what you know, the winter's looking like is we're going to have a whole bunch more holes coming out. Uh, you know, every three, four weeks, uh, you know, you're going to get another deep hole. Between that, let's not forget, we've also got a pretty big silver target here too. All right. So we've got a lot of good, you know, silver news to be putting out, you know, between this as well. Um, we're going to have that IP data coming back and, uh, and, and, you know, we'll have a, have a new drill plan basically out with all that information. And we're going to, uh, we're going to get pretty aggressive on this thing next year. We can start up drilling again here in March. I do want to, um, <clears throat> open up the floor to some questions from the audience. Uh, if somebody has a question, please go ahead and, uh, you know, request to be a speaker. We'll take a couple, um, so how many holes, how many of the deeper holes are pending assays? And, and what can you say about your observations of those holes? Uh, I believe there's eight. So including 26, uh, there's going to be eight deep holes pending. And I'm not telling you squat. <laughs> You're getting breadcrumbs okay. only, buddy. <laughs> okay. Breadcrumbs only. Nice try, though. Nice try, though. Appreciate the effort. All right. Fair enough. And you know, you've you've in your in your background, you spent a lot of time in BC. Uh, you moved down to the you know US, I guess, in the last couple of years. You know, became more focused in Idaho. And what can you tell us about that state and what it's like to do exploration there? Uh, there's no glaciers. Uh, there's no helicopters. Uh, the season is longer. Uh, there's infrastructure. So, so right now I'm staying in a town called Cambridge, Idaho. It's a, you know, you know, you got gas stations, restaurants, Airbnbs, that is a 20, 30 minute drive from the property, right? So, I mean, it is just a lot easier to operate down here. Anything you find, you know, the bar is lower, right? Golden Triangle, obviously the bar is pretty high in terms of grade and size, of, you know, something that's going to work up there. So, you know, I, I wanted, the reason I came down here was I just wanted to set the bar lower on what we needed to find uh, to make something economic. Um, Idaho is, 
you know, some people ask, they say, well, I heard Iowa, Idaho, you know, gets a tough rap and it's tough to permit. And, you know, it's just such a misconception. I mean, Idaho has got to be one of the most pro mining, mining friendly states. I mean, you're going to see some stuff coming out uh, that we're, you know, working on with, you know, some local politicians here that are very, very supportive of the project. I mean, we've got our, our local state representative, Judy Boyle, is writing a newspaper article right now about us and how wonderful this is, how wonderful this discovery is for, for the local communities. Um, you know, this is, you know, you, you look down the street, everyone's got a Trump flag. I mean, these are, you know, just common sense people, blue collar people. Uh, they understand, you know, where their stuff comes from. Uh, you know, they farm. You know, so they get it, you know, it, it's either, you know, you either got to mine it or you got to grow it. You know, all other wealth is just kind of transferred around, but the only creation of wealth comes from the ground. So a great place to operate, lots of support uh, on a state level, on a local level, um, you know, First Nations, you know, all the land is settled, right? You know, it's been treated, you know, it's not like BC where a lot of stuff is still up in the air. You're getting lots of court cases, I just feel like there's a lot more certainty down here and the misconception, like where that comes from is, um, you know, you get challenging projects and, you know, I don't want to like name any names or stuff, but you know, there's companies that are on federal land, entirely on federal forest service land with historical mining that is, you know, basically was left for dead as got all this acid rock drainage, uh, you know, creating these kind of, you know, basically swimming against the current, right? Like if you're on federal land, that's one thing we are on. So everything we've done so far, all the drilling that we've done so far, it's state land that we own the mining rights. We own the surface mining rights to the land. So we're working with the state. We're not working with the feds on all that stuff that we've been drilling. And we don't have to permit anything, any of the exploration disturbance we've been doing, any of the roads we've been building, any of the drill pads, we come in and we just drill. So that's why I'm down here because it's a lot less brain damage for me to work down here and just do my job without having to worry about all that other BS. I feel like that's a that's an increasing trend uh, lately, and obviously there there is a lot of uncertainty in Canada, uh, you know, with what was going on. Um, you know, Core is in Idaho. And, you know, Hecla is in Idaho. Those are obviously, well, I guess Core is becoming more of a gold mining company, but, you know, historically it was silver. Um, have, have you had any contact, you know, with those two larger mining firms? Have they expressed, you know, any interest in your project? Yeah, look, we're, we're signing uh, CAs uh, with a lot of the big groups right now. And... The first rule of a confidentiality agreement is don't talk about the confidentiality agreement, right? Everything is, is going to be confidential, including this agreement. Uh, so I can't name names who I've talked to. Uh, but, you know, to give you some kind of insight into that, the majority of the, the interest from the big boys has been on the back of this news release about the copper. So the copper guys are the ones that are really paying attention to this right now. Uh, more so, I would say, uh, than the silver guys. But look, the silver guys, you're right. You got core mining, you've got Hecla. I mean, these people know how to operate in Idaho, right? So uh, let's not forget that there is a pretty big, uh, you know, silver target on this property as well. So look, no one is out of the picture at this stage. Uh, you know, we've got two major deposit types now on this property. So we've got amazing optionality in that regard. Um, it's just a great problem to have. All right. Very, very well said. Again, I'll, I'll open up the floor if somebody has a question. I know that some people might have stage fright in front of 180 people live, but I uh, do want to give the opportunity to ask a question to Chris Paul. Um, you know, I'm looking at your updated presentation. You changed a few things. Uh, previously, the presentation was very silver heavy at the beginning, and now you're, you're doing a combo 
silver and copper, though, but those are, those are two great metals to be exploring for and finding. Uh, it really, I think those are, those are two very key metals. So you, you have, a you have a, a good problem there with a lot of silver and copper on your hands. And, you know, you, you talk about the short term goals, um, and you know, what do you think the timing of some of this will be the 3d survey, you know, when will that be coming out? And do you add more, you know, rigs to the project now that you're having, you know, mm. these good results? Yeah. So, um, I, I'd say in terms of the deep, deep holes, testing the copper porphyry, uh, I mean, look, five just came out, right? Like we kind of had to slap that release together pretty quickly because I could see there's some volume in the stock and everything and who knows, who knows what. So look, we got that thing out pretty quickly. We're about, you know, three, four weeks behind on the next deep hole, right? Because we went six, seven silver holes and then we drilled eight, I think. You know, if you look at eight, if you look at the plan map and do the trig, I think it's around seven or 800 meters deep. So, yeah, I mean, that that obviously takes a little bit longer to log and cut and sample and ship and assay and get those back. But every three to four weeks, I'd say we should see another deep hole. And in between that, you know, we've got 18 silver holes as well, too. So, um, you know, lots of news flow um we've done uh you know ad added a little bit to our land we, we're going to talk about that um you know the big one for me and you know i don't know <laughs> the big one for me is is going to be the 3d ip i mean that it, it, i i've i've seen some preliminary stuff that's coming back from that and oh my god like this is <laughs> This is going to be, I, I think, in my opinion, I, I, I think this is really going to be what gets people's attention as to the scale of the system, right? So that thing's still in progress. I'd say another three weeks left on the field work. They're going to have tens of millions of data points, uh, 3D data points on this thing. So what they got to do next is... They got these high powered computers. They got to run these inversions. It takes like six weeks uh, to run these complex models. So what is that? Nine, nine weeks away, potentially we'll, we'll have that 3D IP. Um, and, and that'll show the scale. That'll show how big this system can be. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe I'll just add one more sort of side note, just because we're talking mm -hmm. about scale, right? Like you look at, uh, obviously the, the copper geocam, right? You know, it's extending for kilometers to the east. You know, I think the IP is going to do the same. Um, but the fact of the matter is this, right? Like we've always known that the silver system's a big one. That, that rhyolite, we've got three and a half kilometers of that rhyolite exposed at surface. You look at the soils, you look at the rocks. I mean, the entire thing is just, it's just mineralized. And then to the south, you've got these Columbia River basalts, which are these sort of thin, you know, flood basalts that sort of cap all the ridges around here, you know, and it trends under that. But, you know, you look at some of the early releases from like, I think a year ago when we first did the soils and that stuff starts poking out again. So, you know, we've got an erosional window down through the basalt two kilometers to the south of that where the lead and the sink are lighting up again. So three and a half kilometers exposed, you got another two kilometers of that undercover. You got a five and a half kilometer silver system. We know that that silver system is all just being driven by the copper porphyry. So, you know, think about the scale of how big this copper porphyry is going to be. That's all getting covered with this new 3D IP down to 800 meters. I mean, I think, I think this is going to be like, you know, just crazy when it comes out. But that's just my opinion. Okay. We have one question from Alan Barry Labukin. Uh Alan, go ahead and ask the question to Chris. Um, congratulations, Chris. Um, I'm always on the hunt for good copper exploration stories, and there just aren't enough of them out there. Uh, and uh, it looks like you guys are on to a very big system. And um, I, I, 
basically wanted to say congratulations. Uh, you, you, it uh, It's quite exciting. And uh, I love these stories that come out of left field uh, that, you know, all of a sudden catch the market's imagination and uh, it seems to be what you guys have uh, and um, how do you sort of, you must be getting a lot of copper bulls uh, giving you guys a, contact, a call. Yeah, absolutely and, and thanks for the kind words, Alan. Um, couldn't be deeper into left field where this one came from, right? Like you talked to, you know, when we first started talking, you know, early days, hey, we think we've got a copper system that's, you know, copper porphyry system. And everyone's, no, guys, like there's there's no copper porphyries in Idaho. You're not in the right geology, right? So, I mean, it's, this is the first copper porphyry that's ever been discovered in Idaho. It's just Just think about, you know, if you're the big boy companies, you're the big boy copper companies, and you've raced off down to South America and you're in these real tough political jurisdictions to work with, but that's the only place left to look. Like, you know, everyone knows the low hanging fruit's been picked here. Like there's nothing left in the safe jurisdictions. Well, you know, guess what? We've just opened up an entire belt, right? Like I got a little cheeky, called it the Hercules copper belt, but Hey, you know, you find it, you get to name it. So, yeah, there's a lot of attention being paid uh, by the big boys about this. Um, you know, this is this is a district and, you know, I, I'm sure they've looked at it before. And, you know, I actually have evidence that they've looked at it before and gone, well, you know what? Cool. Really interesting copper porphyry prospects here. But it's not a it's not a known district. So we're going to go back to Arizona or whatever and drill two kilometer holes through cover because it's a no, you know, and hit dusters because it's a known copper porphyry district. Um, but expect a lot of activity from the big boys here in the coming while. You guys won't be the first ones that are in the wrong geology to make discoveries. Uh, that's why we do exploration. That's right. That's right. We've, uh, I'm sure a lot of people have read the big score, right? Looking for diamonds found uh robert friedland right found voices bay nickel it happens sometimes uh you know you don't always get what you're looking for but uh it, it ends up being a lot bigger win we'll take it thanks for the question alan um i think that's a that's a perfect place to wrap up there on the big score um i'm rooting for you guys uh chris uh it, it seems like everything that led you to this was just perfect. And now you're just in the right place where you're supposed to be. Um, I look forward to more news from big B I G on the TSX venture. And maybe we'll do this again at some point. Yeah, no, absolutely. Robert. And thanks very much for the Oh, I got one more question, Chris. I got one more question. Okay. You got time for okay. one more. I okay. Sure we'll take one more. Okay. John Lee. commuted there john hey sorry about that hey chris just wanted to congratulate you as well on the on the new discovery i saw in a um in an interview that you had this year that you know your 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 budget your cash is is good you you are fully funded for your your drill program but how does this new discovery um change that scenario and do you still feel pretty confident um you know, you guys will be fully funded and you're not really looking for additional placements or anything like that. And, and, and investors that uh, are really looking to get in are probably going to have to go to the market. Can you kind of provide some color on that? Yeah, no, for sure. Um, yeah, I thought I was going to get away without having to talk about money. But uh, look, the reality is this. Um, I have been hounded, hounded uh, for the last week, uh, with people trying their best to throw money and, you know, throw money at me, I've had to bar the door. Um, you know, the reality is we've got just so you're all aware, uh, as of October 1st, we did our payables on October 1st, 
Uh, my CFO and I, we tallied how much we've got left. It's 2.8 million. So we've still got 2.8 million cash. Uh, there's some 11 cent warrants uh, from Crestcat that are coming due in May. Uh, so, so May 24, uh, that's a pretty well guaranteed $3 million uh, that's gonna get added to the treasury. Uh, there are a onslaught of 30 cent warrants from the last round coming in. So like if I were a guessing man, uh, you know, where's it all going to land? I think we're going to have, I don't know, seven, maybe even $8 million uh, just from that. So, you know, it's, uh, it's certainly been a world-class problem in a bad market uh, to have, you know, every single, you know, fund and banker and institution and family office trying to throw money at you at a higher price. Uh, but look at this stage, we just, we need more information. Um, you know, we got to talk to the big boys, right. Uh, you know, see if there's a strategic opportunity. Um, so yeah, it's just way too early days to talk about it. And I don't care. I look, I've got time on my side. I got money and we got lots of money coming in from the warrants. So I don't need to worry. All right. I like that. I don't need to worry. (laughs) Um, yeah, it's a good place to be. I think we'll, we'll end it there. Thanks for the question, John and Alan and Chris. Uh, have a great day and talk soon. Perfect. Thanks very much, guys. Cheers.